Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I am happy to be with you once again. I hope you had a great weekend. I have been so busy, just so many things have been going on, good things, um, but my husband and I drove five and a half hours north last week for uh, two appointments. His was on Tuesday, mine was on Wednesday, so we had to gather a lot of information for that. Uh, They were visa appointments and they went well, but I was just possibly irrationally nervous about the whole thing. I don't know. I just had, you know, when you start to overthink things and uh, my husband's appointment was first, his went fine. So I should have been like, yeah, tomorrow mine will be no problem. Uh, But I got this thought in my head, like, what if he's approved and I'm not? What am I going to (laughs) do? Just leave him in Portugal and move home? Everything's fine. Our visas were great. We our our visa, uh, our, our appointments were great. We're all good. But yeah, these are things that go through my head sometimes. So anyway, it's been very busy. We um, had a, a nice visit. We, we visited a couple towns while we were up north, and it's so beautiful. Everywhere in Portugal is so beautiful. <laughs> um, but we've uh, visited some new places and a couple places that we've been before and just had an amazing time. So hopefully everything is well with you. We, of course, are here to um, talk about a book and talk about uh, talk to the author about that book. Today I am speaking with author Maggie Smith about her novel Truth and Other Lies. Let me give you the description of that book. Megan Barnes' life is in free fall. After losing both her job as a reporter and her boyfriend in the same day, she retreats to Chicago and moves in with Helen, her overprotective mother. Before long, the two are clashing over everything from pro-choice to Me Too, and not to mention Helen's run for U.S. Congress, which puts Megan's career on hold until after the election. Desperate to reboot her life, Megan gets her chance when an altercation at a campus rally brings her face-to-face with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Jocelyn Jones, who offers her a job on her PR team. Before long, Megan is pulled into the heady world of fame and glamour her charismatic new mentor represents. Until an anonymous tweet brings it all crashing down. To salvage Jocelyn's reputation, Megan must locate the online troll and expose the lies. But when the trail leads to blackmail and circles back to her own mother, Megan realizes if she pulls any harder on this thread, what should have been the scoop of her career could unravel into a tabloid nightmare. All right, so that is the description of Maggie Smith's Truth and Other Lies. You've got... It's told from um, Megan's perspective, but you've also got the stories of her mother, Helen, and of Jocelyn Jones, and um, it's, as I said, told from Megan's perspective, but you get these three intertwining stories in this one story, and there's actually a couple of different uh, other characters and some of their stories that come into play as well, but these three main characters, three very strong women, very strong in different ways, three very opinionated women, three women who are, you know, doing what they do because they strongly believe in it, but they come at it from different perspectives, they come at it from different beliefs, they come at it from different angles, and they are all kind of coming together in this way, and Megan, excuse me, of course, is at the center, she tries to figure figure out everything that's going on with Jocelyn and trying to navigate her mother's campaign and living back at home. It's there's just, there's so much going on and it's so timely because they're talking about, well, it's just, it's so timely. We're going to talk about it more in the book or in the interview. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to let Maggie talk more about some of the things that are so timely, even though the book was written a couple of years ago, right? Because that's how it works when you are writing a book, they don't come out immediately. Um, So I'm going to stop blathering 
and let Maggie talk about this book. Again, the book is called Truth and Other Lies. The author is Maggie Smith. Hi, Maggie. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for being here. We are going to talk about your novel, Truth and Other Lies. Before we do that, though, if you would share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you. Okay. I'm originally from Oklahoma, but I've lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for most of my adult life. I moved up here when I was 26 uh, through a marriage. And um, I have had a kind of varied work career. I started life as a journalist uh, in high school. And then for the first couple of years in college, I was in a school of journalism. Then I switched to psychology and I got a PhD in psychology. And then I switched when we moved up to Milwaukee and became an entrepreneur and sold artwork for a living for most of my career. And then I had an offer for somebody to buy the business that I had founded. So I sold that to them because I had developed a a interest in becoming a writer and thought then I could do that full time. So that's what I've been doing for the last three years or so. And I uh, wrote this novel, which is my debut novel. It's a women's fiction story set in Chicago. Milwaukee's about 90 minutes from Chicago, and I have lived in Chicago in college and briefly during my adult years. So I set it in a bigger city because these people are a little larger than life, and I didn't think they'd probably live in Milwaukee, but I know Chicago area. So um, that's what I've been doing. I also... Uh, I'm a podcast host. I uh, host for the Women's Fiction Writers Association, which is a, a writer's group of about 1,700 women writing in that genre. It's nationwide, and I've done about 150 episodes of that. I uh, blog for the Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers Association once a month on writing topics, and I am the managing editor for Chicago Writers Association for their online magazine, The Right City Magazine, where we publish short, short stories, flash fiction, and poems. So that keeps me pretty busy. I would imagine so. Yes, that is quite a lot, but wonderful. Um, you, you mentioned that the characters are somewhat larger than life. That would be correct. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> can, can, let's, let's talk about the book now. It's called Truth and Other Lies. Can you give an overview of the story? Yeah, it uh, centers around three women, although there's only one narrator pro- point of view character. She is Megan Barnes, and she's a 25-year-old investigative reporter. She, When the story opens, she has been living in New York after graduating from college, and, and she's been working, but she lost her job, and then she lost her boyfriend the same day when she discovered he was cheating. So she's She's flown back to Chicago to kind of write her life, and her best friend lives in Chicago. So she's kind of rebooting her life, I guess, and moving in with her mother, Helen Watkins, who is, unbeknownst to her, running for Congress, uh, primarily because she's been an activist in the pro-life movement. So she has uh, a, a, a lot of name recognition and the Republican party has put her in at the last minute as a candidate. So Megan is a pro choice, her mother's pro life and and her mother forms one of the three triangles of the women in this story. The other one is the person that becomes Megan's mentor and her name is Jocelyn Jones and she is a world famous Pulitzer prize winning journalist. Uh, along the lines of a Diane Sawyer, I tell people, so that, you know, she walks down the street, people recognize her. They've seen her on TV. She's been an anchor on one of the news channels. So she is writing her memoir. And when Megan can't find another job because of her mother's run for Congress and the the uh, kind of conflict of interest there, she goes to work temporarily for a three or four month time period with Jocelyn as a PR person and gets hired on at at Jocelyn's PR firm. So that is the characters that are swirling around. They're each got a little bit larger than life. And the plot is kind of set in motion when a Twitter troll accuses Jocelyn of plagiarism. And she turns to Megan 
and her rest of her PR firm to kind of make this stop, kind of. So that starts starts the plot, which is a little bit of a mystery of who is this troll? Uh, why are they saying this about Jocelyn? How do we shut them down, et cetera? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, the, the all three, well, there's there's more than three characters, but I'm thinking Jocelyn, um, Megan, uh, her mother. They are all, as you said, kind of larger than life, but um, coming at life from slightly different perspectives, but very strong right. women. I, I was. I was yelling, not, you know, how you yell in a book. I was yelling at (laughs) Jocelyn's character um, when she kind of says things to Megan, like, you know, just make it go away is what she's basically saying. And I'm like, she's 25. She's she's never done this before. What are you doing to this young woman? Um, (laughs) Time to take our first break of the podcast. But yes, I do sort of yell at books while I'm reading them or yell at characters in books while I'm reading them. Maybe not yell at them because it's usually in my own head. I don't always say things out loud occasionally try not to do it when i'm in public but at any rate we're going to take our first break when we come back uh, maggie will be talking about the timeliness of this book so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back do you want to be healthier yet you just don't know what to do all these shows telling you this and that but nothing seems to work Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Maggie Smith. And before the break, I was saying how sometimes I yell at characters. And uh, specifically, I was referring to my comment about saying to Jocelyn, she's only 25. Why are you asking her to fix this? Which got me thinking, what did I know at 25? What did I think I knew at 25? What did other people expect me to know at 25? Um yeah, I, I'm sure I knew, I'm sure I thought I knew a lot more. I don't know that I had the confidence that Megan has. I definitely would not have held my own in a conversation with Jocelyn. But what did I think I knew at 25 is maybe a good question. What did I really know at 25? Uh, I don't know. It's something that I will think about. And what do I know now, actually? <laughs> Frankly, I don't know if I, um, I hope I'm smarter, but Anyway, let's return now to the interview with Maggie. Timing of books is always interesting because they are written usually a couple of years before they're published. Um, Right. So the timing of your book is very interesting considering what's been going on the last few weeks with um, the Supreme Court. (laughs) I'm suddenly ripped from the headlines. Yes. Uh, Did you have any idea that uh, you would be quite so timely when you were writing? I didn't. I mean, I knew that the pro-life, pro-choice um, controversy or disagreement or whatever you want to, you know, stance um, has been with us for quite a while. I didn't know it become quite so prominent as it has just the last month. Um, so, yes, that was, uh, I've I've written a couple of social media posts kind of saying, when what you wrote two years ago suddenly seems to be coming true. Um but one of the things I wanted to do, and, and it's not just um, the abortion topic, but there's climate change and and uh, vaccines and all kinds of different things that I was trying to uh, reflect the times of when family members are at, view things differently politically. And I was seeing that happen in my own family and in families of my friends where Thanksgiving dinners were becoming a little bit more acrimonious than they used to be. And I was attempting to paint the characters who view view this uh, this one topic and other topics differently and, and yet 
find a way for them to respect the other's point of view a bit more and be a little bit nuanced about the discussion instead of just standing in the corners and yelling at, at each other. And I think I have, from what I read in reader reviews, I think I did succeed in that. And so I was, if if there was a one of the themes, it was, you know, maybe we all need to get back to listening to each other and understanding what might be behind some of our beliefs rather than just acting as though the other side is a total moron. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's always, always the risk when you uh, deal with controversy. And I also kind of bring home, I think, hopefully in the novel, a bit of the fact that this is also generational because I do have three women that are in somewhat different generations. Jocelyn is 65, 68, somewhere in there. So she is very much of a baby boomer and has her own uh, way of looking at the world. And in some ways that's very similar to Megan, who's more of a millennial in in that they both are what would be termed liberal they both uh f fight against climate change they're both on the same side of the abortion issue and yet also she, for example in the me too aspect they view things very differently and i have one little scene at the end that that really i just uh, people have said, oh, that's your Me Too chapter, um, where Megan is being advised by Jocelyn to kind of play up to this man who has a lot of power that could possibly get her a job. And Megan just is having none of that. And we see that Jocelyn's viewpoint from her generation, and not all baby boomers are like this, but she views it as use it if you can get it. You need all the help you can get and he can be powerful. And, and get you places. Not that she would, you know, do something bad, but just flirt with him a little bit or, or um, you know, soothe his ego. And uh, Megan is just having none of that. So I think there is a generational gap here as well, whereas um, Megan is... Um, viewing the baby boomers as they were going to do all these things. They were going to take care of the climate. They were going to take care of, of civil rights and women's rights and get us, the, you know, the equal rights amendment passed. And they didn't. They sold out and now they've left us with this mess, which I think is, is reflective of many younger generation uh, viewpoint as well. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned ripped it's a long from the answer, but <laughs> no, but but you mentioned you know kind of ripped from the headlines earlier. Well, this is what you were just talking about is, if you will, ripped from social media because now there's this whole theme of okay, boomer, you know, where they're yeah. where the, the the younger generations are very dismissive of older generations and what they went through, and you know, there's kind of right. this not exactly backlash, but but lack of understanding. Right. Um, and I think, you know, there is a scene uh, early on where I, you know, I'm putting my words in Jocelyn's mouth a little bit, but um, where she is expressing that she's saying that Megan at her age is all about want. She wants her own apartment. She wants to have a career. She wants a meaningful relationship. She wants um, to fight for climate change and, and that Jocelyn at her age is all about fear. She's fearing of losing her reputation in the case of the pl plagiarism uh, taunt, but also uh, losing friends through death, uh, losing her mind. I know a lot of people that are baby boomers are, are very afraid of dementia, living, running out of money. Uh, it, it's all about keeping what you've got, keeping what you've been able to achieve and not losing it. So those, those characters view the world very differently uh, because of what is most important to them. And if you can understand, even though you may not agree with another person's viewpoint, if you can at least understand where they might be coming from, I think that's the first step toward respecting their opinion, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you ever... Um, 
I want to think about how I'm, I'm trying to think about how I want to phrase this, but do you ever find yourself hesitating over talking about writing about certain topics or do you prefer to kind of take those controversial topics head on? And um, I'm sure people, uh, family, friends, maybe even say, why are you talking, you know, why are you um, opening that can of worms or do you have to yeah. go there? Do you ever find yourself hesitating? Um. I guess I didn't. Uh, I, I and and it was interesting to me as I began uh, marketing the book. I did get asked that question more, um, and I, I guess my response is: I write adult fiction, and I'm an adult, and that means that my readers are probably adults. It's not written for for YA, and that if we're gonna solve some of these problems we need to start talking about them we can't just not talk about them and pretend that everything is rosy when it isn't um so i i kind of purposely wanted to do that and view and and that's books i enjoy bring bring difficult subjects to the fore as well and i think book clubs enjoy that kind of writing where they can maybe get to know each other a little bit better and and how they view topics uh, that maybe had never come up in the book club before. So I kind of almost purposely did that. And I think also writers tend to want to write things that have conflict and tension in them between characters. And if if characters all agree with each other, there's no tension. So uh, I probably geared toward that as well. That made the mother a little bit more harder to write yes. because full disclosure, she isn't on the side that I kind of come down on personally. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to make her a caricature. I wanted to do what I am kind of saying, I think we all should do, which is understand her a bit more and delve into her deeper about why she might feel the way she does. And so she wound up being my favorite character to write, but she took a lot more work than uh Megan did because I was kind of channeling my 25 year old self in Megan mm -hmm. um so I, that was a good exercise for me yeah. to know that I can write a character that doesn't necessarily agree with what I personally feel time for a second break of the podcast when we come back we'll be talking a little bit more about Megan as the main character and as the perspective for, from which the book is told. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Maggie Smith about her novel, Truth and Other Lies. Let's return to that interview. And in terms of characters, it is told from Megan's perspective. So right. can you talk a little bit more about Megan and why people might resonate with her specifically as the narrator? Well, I, I originally wrote this and, you know, <laughs> that that's always the writer's journey is, you know, did you write it? straight off the bat and no initially i had all three of their points of view and 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 
initially it was an adoption story. It had nothing to do with the plot. That is it. All I had was mother daughter mentor as an idea. And um, I was advised by uh, some, uh, an editor or two that I, I uh, showed the manuscript to early on that I was taking off a big chunk for a first novelist that maybe I might want to dial it back and pick one of these people to be the, to have the other characters in it, but only one be the narrator or the protagonist. So I picked the, the 25 year old because I felt like she was the one that uh, would be dealing with the other two. In fact, the other two really don't ever meet in my book. Um, and although they know about each other through Megan. So I also was interested in the fact that I could remember when I was 25, I did not have a very good relationship with my own mother. And so I, at 25, in my 20s, was looking for a role model uh, to pattern myself after. I wanted to have a career as well as a family. So I, and my mother did not have a career. So I was looking to people that I encountered in, primarily in my training as a psychologist. I had mentors and women professors and women supervisors um, that I looked to, to pattern myself after. And I thought that would be a way that I could bring out some of that that I experienced when I was 25 of trying to figure out what kind of woman I wanted to be. And so that was what I put into Megan and all those idealistic kinds of things that is a great way to feel about the world when you're in your early 20s because there's just so much you feel like is ahead of you. Um, and yet you don't really realize how substantive the decisions you make at that age, which you have very little information about making those decisions, but how substantive they wind up being, who you wind up marrying, the city you wind up uh, staying in, the profession you wind up deciding to uh, pursue. Um, so it just seemed like that was ripe. Megan was ripe for having all those kinds of uh, pa patterns and, and roles in life that I could explore. Mm -hmm. How about um, character development? So you, you have three strong female characters, but there's of course other characters. Um, this was not the direction you were going initially with your story, but um, did you have characters fairly well sketched out before you started writing or did they evolve and change as you write? How does that work for you? Well, the mother evolved. Uh, I think the, the Jocelyn Jones character, I, I fully admit I was, you know, uh, somewhat channeling Merle Streep and Devil Wears Prada with her. And she was kind of fully formed when I thought of her. Uh, Megan was a little bit trickier, but once I kind of got back into, okay, now you're 25, remember what you feel like at that, felt like at that point, she was easier to write to. Um, there were other characters that I, um, you know, initially I had those three as, uh, the mother I had was really more of a, a caricature and I was needing to develop her a little bit more and understand her a little bit more. And I worked with an editor to do that, to uh, dig deeper into what might be going on with her. What does a woman like that? How does a woman like that? And she is divorced. Um, wind up in that situation, what might she be feeling like? So yeah, character was always, the characters were there and then I just put them in a different plot. I, I tried to figure out a plot that might involve all three of those people. And I then kind of tried to make them a little larger than life. Initially, the plot was that um, Helen, the mother, was the illegitimate child of Jocelyn that she had given up for adoption. So it was more of a looking for my birth mother story. Um, and Megan went to work for her, for, in fact, her own grandmother. Okay. And um, 
it seemed as though that was a little bit too much of a coincidence for the editors that I <laughs> that I had look at it. They said, eh, that's a pretty big coincidence there." So when I, when that went out the window, I was I was searching for uh, another plot, and I'm I'm also interested in how social media is starting to affect, particularly famous mm -hmm. um, celebrities. Uh, I guess celebrities are famous, uh, famous people, and mm -hmm. how their reputations sometimes are undone by people that have kind of no power at all except the power of putting something on Twitter or putting something on Facebook. So I thought that was an interesting tact to take uh, mm -hmm. with, with the famous journalist. And that has also evolved quite a bit and, and is more prominent sure. now than when, when you were writing. So it's really very interesting timing for you for the, when right. you were writing and when the book comes out, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. How about research? Um, do you like to do research and did you do any particular types of research for this book? Uh, not a lot. Um, I researched some of the story that Jocelyn is accused of plagiarizing takes place 20 years in the past. So I had to do a little bit of research to ground that story and watch some movies and documentaries about that time period and women that were journalists, war correspondents during that time frame. So I, I could make that more, more authentic, but it isn't, I never really even have a flashback to that exactly. Um, there's a bit of, um, a tape and and some uh, referring to to the story itself. I did a bit of research about journalists. I had a couple of journalists read the the story in early forms. I was in journalism to begin with, but that was quite a long time ago. So I wanted to make sure that read authentically. The PR part, I kind of know about just through learning about PR for marketing my own book. Uh, and I had owned a company and done marketing for them. So I knew a little bit more about that. And uh, Chicago, I knew. I, I, I went back and clarified a bit more. I, I really take my hats off to the people that write historical fiction and do so much research because I mine takes place in 2018 at the midterms. Well, I was around during that time, so I didn't have to delve back into things like people do when they even go back to the 60s and the 50s, which is considered historical research at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of my fellow novelists that write back in, in those periods of time really had to do a lot more research than I did. I was just talking to an author a couple of weeks ago, and he he had been researching train schedules from like the 1890s <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> there's some very I think when people things. do that they really like that they really like yes. the history behind the stuff that's so. why they choose to write that I think so this is your debut novel um are you working on something new currently I am I'm about 200 pages into a new novel uh which I've tentatively named blind spot and it is more of a domestic suspense, I guess I'd say. There is a murder in it. There is a stalker in it. Um, it does have a woman, a single point of view, third person instead of first person this time, uh, of an assistant district attorney. And she does have a daughter <laughs> that's in high school in at this case. And it's really uh, exploring the idea of revenge. Um and I won't say any more about it, but I'm working on that. I read that kind of thing a bit more than straight women's fiction. So it is, I think it's a women's fiction slash domestic suspense. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, working on the first draft of that. But because right. it has a murder, it has to have suspects. And so I'm I'm having to finesse the plot a little bit more and add in red herrings and uh, suspects and clues and things like that. So it's a little bit trickier to write than just yes. a straight up women's fiction is. Do you have a preference between first person and third person now that you've been writing in both? Not really. Uh, I tend to write in first person, but I 
I think I was trying to get a little bit more distance from this one uh, and just experiment with it. But it's very, very close third. So it's really almost like writing in first person. Um, first person tends to be a little bit more immediate. And I think I was trying to, to get a little distance on this one. And I also thought that there was, it might be that I would have to have another point of view. And so if I had written in first person, that would be tricky. So I, I've been writing it in third person to just in case I have to have a third person, mm -hmm. another point of view come in there later. Okay. It's typical that you might have a detective point of view in, a, in this kind of novel. Time for our last break of the podcast. When we come back, Maggie will be speaking about the path to publication, at least for her. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. Time to hashtag everything. We talk about all the fun, crazy stories on social media. From Instagram to Facebook, Twitter to Tumblr, or probably even Friendster. Join us each week as we explore the quirky side of social media. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Social Media Podcast. It's simple, it's simple, such a sad song. The one that Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Maggie Smith. In terms of writing, you uh, you were in journalism for a time, so you've you've written at various points throughout your career. But what made you decide to start writing uh, potentially for publication? I think I was looking for a creative outlet. I wasn't really going to make it a career so much. I was running this business, and it was very uh, it, I sold artwork, so I was surrounded by artwork, but I wasn't doing the creating of the artwork. And so most of what I was doing was marketing and selling and financials and, you know, personnel and lots of different. I was a manufacturer for a while, so I had a crew that was framing the pictures and we were shipping it out. So none of that was overly creative and I wanted a creative outlet so I thought writing was something that I uh, I can't sing and I can't paint. <laughs> so I did photography for a while, and I'm pretty good at that, amateur photography. But I uh, just signed up for a couple of writing classes, and it interested me. So I'm not somebody who said, oh, I wanted to be a writer from the time I was six years old. I've been always a big reader, but not necessarily a writer. So I primarily kind of backed into it. And I love the people that I meet being a writer, other writers, other readers. It's like being surrounded by my community. And I love that part of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, do you have advice for aspiring authors from your own experience then? I think I would say to a very young writer in terms of age, like someone that was 20 or something, as well as writing, I think you ought to live life. You ought to travel, meet people that feel differently about things, other cultures, maybe live in another country. That would be my advice. I think you almost have to have something to write about, some perspective on life to be a successful writer. And so I would think at 20 to 25, 30, I would say, spend more time living life than writing about life so that then later you have something to write about and some perspective. So that would be my advice. Okay. Thank you. How about reading? Do you have favorite authors and genres? You mentioned that you do like to read um, kind of the mystery um, domestic suspense, but who are your favorite authors and genres when you read for yourself? I, I don't read a lot of, um, I don't read a lot of historical fiction. What I read is is contemporary women's fiction, and that would be like 
I, I enjoy Lily King is one of my go-to authors, Ann Patchett, um, Celeste Ning, although she doesn't write very many books. She's written like two books so far. Um, I also like uh, mysteries. So I re Jane Harper, I've, I've loved everything she's written. She's on, written about four books, I think. Uh, Tanya French, I read. She's written more books. Um, lately i've i've really been on a streak of just reading very eclectically a lot of things that are, have been on the bestseller list i've enjoyed two nights in lisbon recently chris pavone was the author he's a male he, he wrote that i thought that was a spectacular novel that starts out as though you think it's a kidnapping and then it turns into something totally different and i really admired that um, I read We Begin at the End by Chris Whitaker and thought that was a tremendous book. Really had very well-developed characters. Uh, kind of a depressing story in some ways, but really a hopeful story in others. Other ways, really rich characters. Uh, really rich 13-year-old that was kind of one of the pro major protagonists in that. I've read several books that I thought were kind of funny. Uh, Lessons in Chemistry is a really funny book that's also kind of a feminist treatise. Uh, Marrying the Catchups I thought was funny. Uh, we're All Damaged I thought was funny. So I, I really, I like reading the first two or three pages on, you know, online on Amazon. And if that I can kind of tell whether that person is a very intelligent writer. And if they do, if they are, I'm kind of in for the haul. They can tell me any story they want because I know I'm in really good hands because they're a really good writer. And that's what I really like to read is really good writing because mm -hmm. it challenges me to be a better writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, how about... Um, internet presence. So website, any social media that you're active on, if you can share that so people can find you. Okay. My my own website is uh, easy to remember, Maggie Smith Writer, W-R-I-T-E-R. -E I usually tell people when I introduce myself, I'm not that one, <laughs> which they're thinking of Maggie Smith, the actress. You know, I was going to say there also that, is but... a Maggie Smith poet. Oh, okay. Um, and so I'm MaggieSmithWriter.com, um, and I am hanging out usually most on Instagram. And there I am, Maggie Smith Writes, W-R-I-T-E-S. And I, I'm posting on Instagram pretty much every day, mostly about books, my own book, other people's books, my podcast. So I'm kind of a big proponent of spreading the word about other writers. I'm a big supporter of debut authors in the women's fiction, but other genres as well. And so I try and do that on Instagram primarily. And say the name of your podcast once again. My podcast is Hear Us Roar. The, all of the podcast segments are on my website. So there's a, a tab that says podcasts. And all of them are on there. They're about 30 minutes. I interview under the auspices of the Women's Fiction Writers Association. So everybody on my podcast, it is their debut women's fiction novel. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of them are women. I think I've had one or two men that wrote women, a women's fiction book. Mm -hmm. And um, so all the podcasts are there. And they are also on Apple and Spotify and Google Play and other channels of distribution, but it's called Hear Us Roar. Okay, thank you. Y you know, when I first saw your name, when uh, we scheduled the interview, uh, my first thought, of course, was, oh, Maggie Smith, but I, I also figured you, you hear that like every time anybody <laughs> hears your name. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, nope, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do occasionally get, uh, Maggie Smith, the poet, wrote a uh book of meditations during the pandemic called keep moving okay. and i did get quite a few people 
private messaging me how mm. meaningful my meditations were to them during the COVID. And I had to say that wasn't me, but here's her website. <laughs> Thank uh, you, but bud. I recently got one that thought I was Dame Maggie Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Not a horrible person to be compared to, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe sometimes people, you know, contact her thinking that she's you. Maybe that's it. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> At any rate, Maggie, we've talked about a variety of things during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to highlight at this point? Uh, no, I think I would just encourage people to read any chance you get, a, maybe a wide variety of authors. I think sometimes if you walk in a bookstore or you just um, you know read about things online, you're really only reading about the really small subset of people that get published by the big five and their imprints. And there are all kinds of people out there that are indie publishing themselves that are with small presses. I'm with a small press um, and, and I got a lot of national publicity, but I, I also uh, wrote kind of a buzzy book, but there are people that write nice, quiet little books that are great books. And so I guess, you know, belong to a book club, ask your local librarian, ask your books, independent bookstore owner for recommendations of maybe books that don't have as, as big a splash in the marketplace. And the last thing I do is I really enjoy um, interfacing with book clubs. I think my book has a lot of things that lend themselves to discussion. And I have a place on my website where book clubs can go there and ask me to zoom in on their book club. If you're in the greater southeastern Wisconsin, Chicago area, I can even come to your book uh, club. But if you're other places, I can zoom in and talk about the book and talk about my experience of writing the book. And I love to interface with readers. So I'd love to do that. Okay, thank you so much for all of that. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me about your book and writing. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for spreading the word about books. Thank you again to Maggie for joining me to talk about truth and other lies along with writing and everything else. I also want to piggyback on something that she was saying there at the end of reading, broadly reading, um, not just what's popular, etc. And I, I want to add on to that in a very specific way in that um, don't just read if you if you're on TikTok, specifically book talk, don't just read the books that are on book talk. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the books that are on book talk, but there's so much more out there. And sometimes I, I watch book talk, and it's just the same things over and over and over again. And some of them are good. And some of them I don't find as good. And there's again, nothing wrong with that, because everyone has different tastes. But uh, branch out, read something that you might not necessarily read, read, um, read something that you hear about on this book, talk, this, this podcast, not, pun um, not, um, touting my own podcast, although I should, but, uh, I'm just saying that I interview a lot of debut authors on here and that is a great place to find someone new and to support someone new and someone that, uh, maybe no one else has heard of, but that you fall in love with. So, that's just my two cents for the day. Thank you again to Maggie for joining me. Thank you, as always, for joining me. I so appreciate you. Um, I hope that you'll join me for the next episode when I will be joined by author Patrizio X. Maya uh, for to talk for to, geez, to talk about his book, Rigaton Cruise. So join me for that. Uh, as always, if you're a fan of this podcast, please do me the honor, the favor, what have you, of liking, subscribing, doing all those great things that get you access to the episodes as soon as they come out, but also uh, leaving a review on any of those platforms that you listen to the podcast on. That can be starred. It can be written. It very much helps us to get the podcast out to more people. And I very much appreciate it when people do that. Thank you so much. Also follow on social media, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram and Twitter. Love to hear from readers. So let me know what you're thinking about life, about books, about everything. As always, hope you're having a great Tuesday. I hope that your weekend went well. I hope that your week is starting off well. But as always, I hope that your life, your time, wherever you are at this point, I hope that it affords you plenty of time to get yourself lost 
in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.